I got to be honest, when I first met Tom, I really didn't know what to think. And I don't know if you guys had that experience. I didn't know what to think uh, because he was emotional energy, still is emotional energy plugged into a wall. He's like, how you doing, Brian? I just got in, in uh, church planning nations. And um, so I, uh, he was just bouncing off the walls. He kind of reminded me and still reminds me some of like a, the, the pastoral version of, of Robin Williams, just like, you know, blah, 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 all over the place. And, uh, and if you know me, uh, that, that's not me. Like Tim, uh, Tim, Tom and I are, are different. And by different, I mean like opposites. And when I first met him, so I was young pastor and uh, when you're younger, you tend to you tend to view the world through yourself, and so you begin to to judge every you judge everything based upon how you would do things. And uh, I am what you would call a, a contained extrovert. I, I do like people. I do like being around people. I prefer the party over reading a book, uh, but I just don't put my emotions out there. I th- I'm measured. Um, probably my worst nightmare is uh, embarrassing myself. So I'm very apprehensively emotional. And so when I met Tom, I was like, you can't be a leader and be that emotional. I like, you just, it's just not the way you're a leader is a leader is measured, knows what he's doing. And, da, da, da. and uh, Tom may have been thinking the same thing. He'd been like, how could you lead and, and be so measured? You got to be, you know, hard on your sleeve. And um, you know, we were just totally different. And so, I mean, just in that five minute conversation, he probably expressed more emotion than I did the entire year. And it was like July. And so it was, there is a difference there, but I think one of the beauties and what I appreciate about our family of churches is the maturity and the diversity to where, you know, we are different. And, uh, but what we find is, is genuine, genuine connection. And so much so uh, when it was time to name our, our group of churches, we came on the name Confluence for, for that reason. I mean, if you don't know what a Confluence is, it's a, it's a, where two rivers come together and create a bigger river for more flow and impact. And we love the idea of, of people coming together, of churches coming together, of ideas coming together to create more flow and impact. And the more the, the diverse, the, the colors and the, and the sizes and shapes, and I mean, just the better. And so that's kind of born true out in our relationship. And just as I'm so glad it, it, it's that way, because I probably would have been inclined just to, you know, nice to meet you. Thank you very much. But Tom and I have become very, very dear friends. And uh, I remember when he was talking to us just about what he was doing and, you know, we've totally behind it. I, uh, he's just like, man, I just, I feel like God's doing. And I'm just like, I'm in, I think he probably felt like he had to come in with all of his charts and graphs and explain it to me. But I was like, man, I'm in and uh, whatever Tom's up to, I'm in. Um, So I'm glad to know him. And if you are watching this and not fully in yet, you're just, crazy not to get connected with this church plant. It's awesome. So today I want to talk to you about Encounter with God. If you you have a Bible, turn to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. I want to talk to you about how Encounter with God leads to mission with God. Um, Let me tell you a little bit about, uh, you know about Tom, let me tell you a little about my wife, uh, Rachel. We, we've been married, we'll be married 20 years this year. Um, And we couldn't be more perfect uh, for each other. Uh, we, we come, we come together, uh, quite nicely like peas and carrots. And, um, but when we met 21 years ago, we were a very unlikely pairing pairing, uh, cause to be honest, from a distance, we weren't each other's type. I mean, she's from, uh, the, the, she's creative. She's from the creative artistic world of beauty and feelings. I'm from the efficient, driven world of productivity and ideas. She's about the present, fostering connection. I'm about the future and fostering action. She likes decoration and, you know, stuff on the wall. I, you know, I didn't own any furniture. I, my furniture was a TV tray uh, and a milk uh, carton, or not carton, crate to put my TV on. That was my furniture. And so we, we were just different. She's in design, I'm in the sports. Um, she's in the variety. I'm in the sameness. So like my diet, when we met like her, there was more variety in her diet, like in a week than that I've ever had my entire life. She, so she was just so, so different. So from a distance, we weren't each other's typed. And so you're asking yourself, okay, so what changed? What was the difference? How did you guys, how did, how did it happen? Well, um, I met her. Um, I encountered her. Um, and now I eat 
quinoa or some people call quinoa. And so like with all different kinds of things, I have a line item in my budget called furniture. I watch baking shows sometimes all by myself. I don't know if you've ever had that moment where like, you know, I'm watching this baking show and then all of a sudden I realized that I'm by myself. Everyone had left and I'm, and I had a decision make and, and now I'm in season eight. And so like, I just kept watching and watching and watching. And so a lot about me has changed over the years because sometimes, and I think you've probably found this to be true. Some encounters with are so powerful. They can be absolutely life-changing. And this is never more true than the encounter that you have with God. And this may help some of you who are trying to, you know, like, you're trying to figure out the whole Christianity thing. Like, um, you know, cause, cause I hear this a lot. I hear, I hear this phrase a lot. I don't know that, um, God's my type. I don't know if I'm God's type. You know, you hear that, like there, there's the Christian type and I'm not it. Uh, this may help. Nobody is the Christian type. Not, there's not one person in the world who is the Christian type. Uh, Romans three 10 says this, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands, check this out, no one seeks God. Nobody does this. Nobody looks at God in it from a distance and says, oh, that's it, that's my type, and I am his type. We are all from a distance. Nobody is God's type. Okay, so how are there like 2 billion people right, you know, in the world right now, granted over Zoom, worshiping God, pouring over the script? How'd that happen? Well, quite simply, they encountered him, and it changed their life completely. And that's what happened to Isaiah. And so I want to take a look at that with you today. So Isaiah 6, um, I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, and we'll chat a bit. So here it is, uh, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train on his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook as the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Um, what's interesting about that last phrase when, when Isaiah says, here I am, send me, we, we approach God's presence wanting God to be available to us. But when we truly encounter God's presence, we make ourselves available to him. We, we come to him saying, God, th there's some things that I need. There's some things that I want. And so we approach God with those needs. But what happens when we truly encounter God, we want to make ourselves available to him. And what I want to point out really quick before I get into the nuts and the bolts, because this is key to understanding, I think, not just this passage, but really the heart of God and the thrust of what we're all doing. You know, why Sanctuary Church? Why Jubilee Church? Why, you know, Confluence? Why the whole bit? Uh, God has a heart to reach the world. That's his heart. He's a father. He, he, the big picture of God, he's a father and he wants a family of every tribe and tongue. And guess what? He's going to get it. And his plan is to use, you know, people like you and me, fragile jars of clay, you know, broken, weak, insignificant, but he wants to use us. And so his big agenda is to, is, to, is to put us on a search and rescue mission for his lost kids all over the world. Even though, you know, people have values that are at odds with this kingdom, he loves them and he wants to bring them back. And so he wants, he wants to send us out on this search and rescue mission. Now, this is going to come as no surprise to anyone, uh, but oftentimes, and it's been my experience, that, that a lot of Christians don't necessarily share that same heart. See, God's heart is to reach the world, but some don't. So some have the posture, uh, and, and, and maybe you know people like this, or, or maybe if you struggle with this today, I hope these words will help you. Uh, some people have the posture uh, to judge the world. They think their job is to judge. And so the, you know, the idea is that Christians are the good guys, and, 
and it's a good, it's a job of the good guys to beat the bad guys. And so when they look at the world, they're motivated by anger about the world. They're, they, they're, they, they have no idea why non-Christians won't act like Christians and it, and it sparks outrage in them. They, they, they don't know why Christian, they don't know why people don't want prayer in school. They don't know why, you know, Starbucks won't say Merry Christmas. They wonder why, you know, the Pillsbury Doughboy isn't wearing any pants. Like they're just outraged and full of anger about the way that non-Christians are and their posture is to judge the world. Um, this may help if you're in that place. Uh, there, the, there is no good us and bad them. Uh, there's just a sinful we and a gracious he. Uh, religion wants to divide the world into good guys and bad guys, but the gospel just divides it up in bad guys and Jesus. That's it. And after all, Jesus did not come to beat the bad guys. He came to be beaten for the bad guys. And thank God he did because I am one of those bad guys. So one posture that, that Christians sometimes take that we sh shouldn't have any sympathy for is to judge the world. Now, there's another posture some people, Christians take that is to avoid the world. Uh, this group practiced social distancing before social distancing was a thing. They just created their own subculture, their own music, their own, you know, every, you know, and you don't want to get too close to people who sin or you may catch the sinnies and like, you know, you just, you know, wear a mask at all time, avoid people. And they're not motivated by anger. They're motivated by fear. So we have to hunker down and they tend to be more conservative. And I just want to commend, first of all, if this is you or if you know someone like this, I just want to commend their desire for holiness. Like their desire, they understand that Christians are meant to be distinct and different. And that is a part of the call of the Christian. We are called to be separate. We're called to not be, we're, we're not called to simulate. We're called to be separate. But what, what they miss, what they miss is to have the holiness of God requires you to have the heart of God. And to have the heart of God is to remember that he left the safety of heaven and took on the vulnerability of earth. I mean, to an extreme way. He became a human, not just a human, but he became a baby. Uh, and he was born to, he was born into poverty in the midst of, a, of an oppressed minority. And so, he, that's what, God, in fact, he had a nickname. I don't know if you knew that Jesus had a nickname because of his association, because of the people he hang out. He was called the friend of sinners. And the last thing that Jesus said to us wasn't to go in your home and hide, but to go into the world and share. And I'm glad that he did not keep his, death. so that's the other group, avoid the world. The other, the other, there's a third group uh, and they want to mirror the world. Now, what's interesting, those who want to mirror the world and those who want to avoid the world are both motivated by fear. But they're not, those who want to mirror the world, they're not, they're not motivated by fear. They're not, they're not afraid of rejection, or excuse me, they're, they're, they are afraid of rejection. They're not, they're not afraid of, of uh, being affected by the world, but they're uh, afraid of being rejected by the world. And they tend to be more liberal in nature. And again, I want to commend this group for building bridges, for staying connected, for having compassion, for being savvy and knowing the way. That's a, that's a big part. We want to contextualize as, as Christians. Uh, but what they've missed in their own heart is a migration of hope. And what their hope is in what humanity can do and not what God can do. So they, they, they put their hope in what world can do. Now, what God is looking for, drum roll, please. He's looking for a group of, thank you very much. Uh, he's looking for a group of people who want to transform the world. And so they, they, they don't want to judge, but they kind, of, they kind of combine the best of those who want to avoid and those who want to mirror. Uh, they, they understand that they need to be distinct and different, but they need to befriend and get up close. Um, no closer than six feet, but they need to get up close around people, being a witness, and they are motivated by love. And you see this very clearly in the life of Daniel. If you see, if you know about Daniel, you know, uh, you know, he, he's, he's known for more than just being in a lion's den, uh, but he was the second in command. So he got very high up in the, in the political and governmental structure. In fact, he was the, the he was the spiritual advisor of not one, not two, but three regimes. 
and which is phenomenal. I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine uh, George Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump all having the same advisor? That, that's unheard of. And this is in a culture where kings would kill the, <laughs> they would kill each other once they took over. So they just cleaned house, except every regime says, I want that guy, Daniel. So this guy was clearly, this guy was clearly in sync and knew how to move within culture yet, and yet he would not eat the king's food. And three times a day, he would quiet himself before the Lord. He was in culture, but he was distinct. And because he was distinct, but amongst, he transformed. And that's what you and I need to do. And to do that, we have to get the heart of God. And here's the big point. The point is, encounter with God always leads, always, always leads to mission with God. It's not just with Isaiah. It happened with Abraham. He encounters God. God's like, okay, now I want you to be on mission with me. It happens with uh, Moses, you know, the burning bush. I want you to go be me in, in the land of Egypt. It happened with the disciples. Mark 1.17. Now, those who know your Bible well, please don't, for the sake of this illustration, please don't blurt out the answer. But just think about this for a second. In fact, if you have a lot of Bible knowledge, just, just forget it for a second. Jesus said to a group of followers, to, excuse me, to people who would be followers, he said this. He says, follow me and I will make you blank. Now, just think about what you might want to put in there. If you were just to notice Christians and how Christians are, you know, you might be like, follow me and I will make you really good at knowing your Bible. That seems like a reasonable thing. Follow me and I will make you a really moral person. Follow me and I will make you a really charitable person. Follow me. This is what he says. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The key agenda for God in your life once you encounter him is he wants to send you out on the search and rescue mission because this is what God cares about. And if, and if you're a parent, this actually is quite intuitive. We've all had the moment where we've lost a kid. We've all had that moment. I mean, I, 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 I can think about times where I've been in the grocery store. In fact, you know, you've all had that moment where you've, you know, like you're, you've got your kids and you're, you're, you're there, you've got your list, you're there to shop for stuff. You know, you've got, you know, you want to get milk and cereal and, you know, toilet paper and, you know, more toilet paper. If they have, you, you have your list, you're there and you're engaged. And all of a sudden you're like, you look down and you notice that one of your kids is missing. You've got three with you, but now you only have two and you realize one of your kids is missing. So you start frantically looking up, up and down every aisle, but you don't see him. And then you go and you find a security guard and you're like, Hey, have you seen my son? And, and they seem kind of uninterested. And uh, it's kind of one of those moments. It's like, man, you, you should be helping me, but you seem like totally uninterested. And you're, you're going around and going around and you go outside and you don't see him. You're, you're yelling. And then all of a sudden your kid, you know, like yanks on your shirt and saying, are we still going to have chocolate tonight, mom? And you're sitting there thinking like, you know, that would, that's a really great question if your brother wasn't lost right now. And you think about the security guard who's, who's indifferent about the fact that you have a lost son. And if your son continues to be lost, the friends in your life, the ones that really know you and love you, get caught up in your desire to find your lost son. And if you came up, if, if, you're, if you had a friend and, and you said, hey, my son is lost, will you help me? Can you imagine a friend saying to you, you know what, it serves them right. They deserve to stay lost. They should have stayed by you. They, they want to judge your son. Or, or, or could, you, could you imagine um, the, 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 the friend who would say, you know what, I, I've got my own problems. If, if I get close to your son, maybe I will also be lost. Like, so I don't want to get too close. Like that person wouldn't really have your heart. Or, or someone who would say, you know, well, who am I to judge really if your son is lost or not? Like maybe he's exactly where he wants to be. 
you, that person would not, they want to mirror your son. That person wouldn't have your heart. The people who would have your heart are the people who would want to find your lost son. And that's exactly the way Jesus feels. In fact, he said it quite frankly, the son of man, this is Luke 19, 10, the son have man, have man, of man has come to seek and save the lost. And he tells three parables in Luke 15, and they all have the same point. God is looking for lost things. He's looking for a lost sheep. He's looking for a lost coins. He's looking for a lost son. Which one of you, if you, if you had a hundred sheep, if you lost one of them, would you not leave the 99 to go for the one? If you had 10 coins and you lost one, would you not tear your t entire house, your entire life? Would you not put it upside down in order to find that coin? Which one of you, if you had two sons and you lost one, would not be heartbroken and then when the son returns throw a party when that son comes back and that's exactly what god wants he has a heart to save people and god jesus came jesus came to seek and save the lost and about 40 times in the gospel you can it may be more maybe less but something around 40 times Jesus uttered the phrase, the father has sent me, the father has sent me, the father has sent me. And at the end of his life, he said, as the father has sent me, so I send you. So Christian friends, Christian brothers and sisters, why are you on earth? He has sent you to seek and save the lost. Ephesians 3.10, if you want to know why you are breathing air right now, Ephesians 2.10, for the foundations, before the foundation of the earth, God has predestined you as his masterpiece. You're completely unique in the call of God on your life, but he's created you as a masterpiece to walk in the good works that he has prepared in advance for you. Every day, someone to care for, every day, someone to love, every day, someone to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, here's where I need to take you back to the scriptures because you're thinking like, okay, I got to get busy. I better, I know it. I know, Brian, you're putting the screws to me. And like, I know I'm supposed to be a better Christian. I should be evangelizing more. That's not what I'm trying to do. Um, it's really easy to make people feel guilty with the Bible. And that's not what I want you to do. But I want you to understand that the heart of God is to seek and save lost kids. And if you don't have that heart, here's what you need to do. You don't need to like white knuckle it and try harder. You don't need to put a list of people together, although that's practical and helpful. I would encourage that. But what you need to do is you need to have an encounter with God. An encounter with God always leads to mission with God. And that's what we see here in the text. So I'm just going to run through this real quick and then we'll close and pray. And so verse one, I'm just going to walk through. What does it look like to encounter the real God? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, let me just explain that really quick. Um, in these days, the, the train on your robe, right? So you almost think it's like a, a wedding gown kind of train. Like the, the, the length of, your, of the train on your robe was, a, was a, uh, a reflection of how big your kingdom was. So if you had a really long train to your robe, it meant you had a really long kingdom, really big kingdom. And if you had a really short train to your robe, it meant you had a really small kingdom and you were in counseling once a month. And so we, but this, when it says, so what the writer's saying is that when the train of his robe filled the temple, what he was trying to communicate is that in the presence of God, there is no room for any other authority or agenda. There's none. It fills the temple. So when you encounter God, there is no Jesus has an agenda plus mine, plus America's, plus whatever. There is no other room for no other authority. And then above him stood the seraphim, which were angels, all right? They're talking about angels. And, and the I am just means plural. So seraph meant, actually the word seraph uh, this is even more phenomenal, I think. Seraph means burning one. All right? So burning, bur seraph means burning one. I am means plural. So these are burning ones. So this group of burning beings we call 
angels, which is not what we, <laughs> not what we think about when we think of angels. We think of like, you know, a naked baby with a harp and, you know, on a cloud. And um, that's not the kind of being that's here. And that's not the kind of being that we, of angels we see in the Bible. In fact, here's a little fun fact trivia, a little Bible trivia for you. The two most common phrases in the Bible spoken by angels are fear not and get up. Here's the point. Angels are scary. All right. Biblically, angels are scary. So this is the scene here. And then they're, they're saying something to each other. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Now, why the, reputa the, uh, the repetition? Some of you may know this, but uh, in the English language, there's like a million words. And in the Hebrew language at this time, there's about six or 8,000 words. So in the, in, the, in the English language, you know, if you want to say something is really big, you have, you have lots of options. You could say it's enormous, it's gigantic, it's whatever. And, and in the Hebrew language, they would repeat it twice. So, so you might be familiar in the New Testament where it'd say like, you know, truly, tr Jesus would say truly, truly. And anytime it would repeat it twice, uh, it's trying to add emphasis. And so this is very famously said in, in uh, Genesis 14, 10, it's called the pit pits. If you some of your translations may say the miry pits, or they may say, you know, the, the bad pits, but the real translation is it's the pit pits. And what they're trying to say is that these pits, the pit pits are the pittest pits of them all. And so they are communicating the, the emphasis here that, you know, though, so there, there's lots of places in the Bible where, where words are repeated twice, but did you know that there's only one place in the Bible where a word is repeated three times and you're, looking at it right now. And the reason why is because it, it, when you think about it, it's describing God. Uh, it never says in the Bible that God is power, power, power. It actually doesn't even say that God is love, love, love. But the fundamental characteristic of God is that he is holy. He is holy. He is holy. He is not like you. He is not like you. He is not like you more than any other attribute. He is big, we are small. He is high, we are low. He is great, we are not. He is good, we, there is a gap. And Isaiah feels this gap, all right? So he's, he's in this scene where the, the, the train of his robe is filling the temple. You've got these burning beings speaking to each other. He is not like us, he is not like us, he is not like us. Isaiah feels this gap. And that's why he says, and you might want to underline this in your Bible, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. Now watch this. Um, the, one of the angels flew to me and having his hand on a burning coal and had taken his tongs from the altar, he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is he toned for? Um, at the place of his expressed sinfulness, the angel mediated this atonement for his sin, this place of altar. And we know that there was another altar in the fast forwarding to the New Testament, and it wasn't uh, this scene, but it was the cross. And on the cross, the reason why Isaiah was able to receive this atonement is what Jesus would do. Now, Isaiah, Isaiah, he's in this scene where he felt like when he got into the presence of God, he felt like judgment was going to come down on him. But instead of judgment, he received grace. And that's what happened on the cross. The reason why we're able to encounter the goodness of God at, at any level is because we come into, we have this moment, we are encounter God. And we realize how big he is, his authority, his power, his might, uh, his otherness. And we have, this, we have this moment of humility in this, in this moment of like judgment is going to come down on us. But the reason why judgment doesn't come down on us is because judgment came down on Jesus before us. And when we, ha when we have that moment where we realize the grace of God, like we encountered the real God, not the God that we make up, but the real God, we realize that the, the depth of the grace that he showed for us. 
And while we came to him wanting God to be available to us, when we encounter the real God of the Bible, we want to be made available to him. And that's what happened to Isaiah. That's why he prayed the prayer. Send me, send me, send me. Here I am, send me. And that's what you and I do. When, when we, you and I encounter the real God of the Bible, here's what's going to happen. You're going to make yourself available to him and you'll have the courage to pray this prayer. Well, what does this look like practically? Well, it looks like it looks a lot different before and after COVID. So I'll give you some principles and not get real practical. But here's what I think it means. I think it means taking personal responsibility for the lost people in your life. There's a time in the life of Ezekiel where God says to, through the prophet, that if you preach the, if you preach to people and they don't repent, their blood is on them. But if you don't preach to them, their blood is on you. In what he's trying to communicate is that God has given us, not because he's wanting to, you know, scare us into doing stuff, but he's wanting you to know he's what he, in his grace. He's wanting you to know, here's how, you know, you have my heart is when you begin to take responsibility for the people around you. And I don't know what the rest of summer is going to look like or the fall and how this is going to affect your plan. I have no idea how it's going to affect, um, you know, the church that I lead, but here's what I know. I do know this physical confinement will not affect our witness. Um, and I know that for a lot of reasons, but mainly through the life of Paul. If you know the life of Paul, you know that he spent five years of his prime ministry life in prison. All right. I don't think the quarantine will last five years, but even if it does, it did not affect the witness of the Apostle Paul. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2.9, he says, I am bound with chains as a criminal, but check this out, but the word of God is not bound. I am bound, but the word of God is not bound. In Philippians 1.12, it says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What had happened to Paul in Philippi? He was thrown into a hole in the ground, which was their prison, basically. And he's like, well, how, you know, I want you to know what's happened to me has really served the God. So what he did, he took advantage of new opportunities. And the whole Praetorium Guard, upward of maybe 600 soldiers, heard the gospel. So even in our confinement, it may not be the same opportunities pre-COVID, but post-COVID, there's new opportunities. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole Praetorium Guard for us to witness to. The gospel is not contained. So, so here's, here's what I want to do. I know it's terrifying. I know it's a risk. But I want to encourage us to, to, to get into this, this uh, two-part motion. Encountering God, expressing that heart to reach people. Encounter, and I think they work together almost like a bicycle. Like if you're always encountering God and you never work out what it means to have that heart, it's like trying to pedal a bicycle once, you know, with one leg and it just doesn't work or doesn't work as very well. And so one of the things Paul says to the Philippians, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, God's work things in, you work it out. So God works in a heart for people, work out that heart for people. God works in a heart for people, you work out for that. So it's not, it's not a works-based thing, but it, it's, it's taking that encounter and that motivation that we're going to get here in a moment, especially as we worship God. We're going we're gonna to encounter the real God. What's going to happen here over Zoom, you know, we're 2,000 miles apart, maybe 6,000 miles apart if you're in the UK, but, the, but God is omnipresent, but he's also with us, and he's going to, he's gonna, we're going to encounter him. And so I, I want us to, I just want us to meet that God, and I want us to, I want us to pray, God, I, consider, I want you to consider how he might send you out. So let me pray for us before we go into worship. I just want to pray this over us. And just before I do, I just want to thank you once again for letting us have it. Let me, let me pray for us. Um, and I want you to remember this. This is another cool thing. I want you to remember that the presence of God, remember this, the presence of God that was once lethal to you is now for you. Here's the thing. It's a, the, the world is big and bad and there's a lot of risk, but the presence of God that was once lethal to you is now for you. And if he is for you, fill in the blank. What can be against you? 
The answer is nothing. So we need to tap into uh, the presence of God for passion, for energy, and for boldness. God, I just thank you. Just thank you for your, your grace. Uh, God, your reputation for being loving, Lord, sometimes causes us to take for granted the fact that you are other, the fact that you, there, there's no other authority in your presence. And Lord, we just want to turn from having that image in our head. We also want to turn from the image that you're just angry and upset with us, but you love us. And this isn't about getting us to do stuff, but this is about getting caught up with your heart. Lord, you have lost kids. You have billions of lost kids all over the world. And God, your heart is to reach every single one of them, of every tribe and every tongue. And God, we want to be a part of that. We want to be a part of the eternal history that matters, your redemptive history. We thank you for your grace in our life. And I just want to pray grace over my brothers and sisters. I pray those who've never encountered you, God, I just pray right now you would give them the grace to respond. And I pray for the city of San Francisco. When I think about the lost people in that seven by seven mile area, I just pray for your presence to fall in that place. And I just pray for many, many lost kids of yours in that city, in that great city. I just pray for many, many lost kids to come home in your, in your precious name. Amen.